think I need to uh, start by making a momentous announcement. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the true Quran, the pure Quran, never existed in the past. The Prophet Muhammad received the Quran and wrote to his own hand. And the last surah revealed, surah number 110, was revealed in his Hajj pilgrimage only a few months before he died. The last, it was the last surah revealed. The last surah revealed in Medina was surah number 9. So the Prophet had the Quran written in his own hand in the chronological sequence with instructions on the side saying where every piece goes. That's all the Prophet had. It was not the Quran that God intended for the world. Nineteen years later, during the era of Osman, Islam had gone to Syria and Iraq and Egypt, and uh, Osman wanted to make copies to send to those new Muslims, new countries. So he appointed a committee to to carry out the Prophet's God's instructions, take that original copy. By that time it was it was with the Prophet's wife Hafsa, Omar's daughter. Osman sent for it and he gave it to the committee to to carry out the instructions. This goes here, this piece goes here, and put the Quran in the order that God intends for the world. <coughs> And I think you know the rest of the story where when they finished and they came to the last surah revealed in Medina Surah 9, someone suggested to add a couple of verses to honor the Prophet. So they committed that, uh, that big uh, crime that caused the war between Ali and Osman and then the, the war against Ali and his family, the Prophet's family that ended with the eradication of the Prophet's family in Karbala and the winners were the Umayyads who, who put the two verses in the Quran. So the version that came to us about the war and the history of the Quran is the version of those uh, so-called winners. They thought they won the war. So uh, the announcement I want to make is that this is the last time we use this. As of next week, we'll use the new translation. <laughs> so, uh, it will not be in the book form yet, so, but we, you will be handed the, the new translation to study. This is the last time we used it, so it's a historical book. But uh, the new uh, translation that's going to come out is going to be hard cover, it's going to be luxurious. With, uh, you see the page there, this is a very hazy uh, uh, cover. It's not a good one, but it's going to be sharp and it'll be in, in gold stamp. The, the, uh, the, the cover itself, out, the hard cover outside will be dark blue. And it will be, the, for the first time in history, the pure Quran, in Arabic and in English. So, uh, as you know, <coughs> uh, some of you read uh, the small booklet about the two verses. And uh, I, I mentioned many of the reasons why God did not let those people have the pure Quran, because they simply did not deserve it. It was only 19 years after the Prophet's death, they corrupted the religion, they, they started to worship Muhammad against his will, in the same way the Christians do with Jesus. They're all humans. The Christians are humans and the Muslims are humans and both of them fell for the trap of Satan and they started to idolize the Prophet against his will. They, uh, they, they invented an adhan that has the, does not have the name of God alone. The prayer became distorted, did not have the name of God alone. And just uh, to make a long story short, they did not deserve the pure Quran. Now there are people who devote their worship to God alone they uphold the Qur'an alone, and these are the true Muslims. The true Muslims will have the true Qur'an. And this is really a, a historical 
historical event. Uh, as you know, uh, the famous statement in the Quran is that the, uh, the month of Ramadan is when the Quran was revealed. And this is exactly when the Quran is going to be completed and will be purified and it's going to come out, it's going to be sent to the press in Ramadan, inshallah. And I, I, I know you believe me when I tell you that I didn't plan it this way. It was not planned this way. As a matter of fact, I was slowed down so many times, I was frustrated due to my ignorance. I shouldn't be frustrated. You know, you should know that God is arranging the, the time. And uh, all these delays were designed so that the, uh, the pure Quran would come out in Ramadan. So uh, I'm glad to share this with you. Now we go to our teacher, Catherine, and we'll start at Surah 62. We're on page 397. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Glorifying God is everything in the heavens and the earth. He is the King, <coughs> the sacred, the almighty, the most wise. He is the one who raised among the Gentiles a messenger to recite his revelations for them, sanctify them, and teach them the scripture and wisdom. Before this they had gone astray. Others among them refused to join. He is the almighty, the wise. This is God's grace. He bestows it upon whomever he wills. God possesses unlimited grace. The example of those who were given the Torah then failed to study it is that of a donkey carrying great works of literature. Miserable indeed is the example of those who reject God's revelation. God never guides the wicked people. Say, O oh, you who are Jewish, if you claim that you are God's chosen to the exclusion of all other people, then you should long for death if you are truthful. They never long for it because of what their hands have committed. God is fully aware of the wicked. Say, the death that you flee from will inevitably catch up with you. Then you will be turned over to the knower of all secrets and declarations. He will inform you of everything you did. Glorifying God is everything in the heavens and the earth. He is the King, the Sacred, the Almighty, the Most Wise. If we take that thought through all of our day, God will be our God all day long. Because everywhere we look and everything we do, everything we hear, everything we see is submitting to God, including our bodies, our minds, and our hearts. Donna said recently that we should strive to be like the animals and the rocks and the mountains and the trees. And when she said that, <coughs> I agreed with her. Um, this is going to sound funny. I've always been fascinated by rocks, <laughs> mountains. Um, and when I was in Ireland, alhamdulillah, for a short period of time, I was fascinated even more because the people live on a rock. They have to carry dirt and put it between rock crevices to grow food, and then it blows away and they have to repeat the process again. The rocks remain in the people full. Uh, they've worked out a compromise with God, as it were, and they have, in the example of the rocks around them, the mountains and the boulders, what they should be striving to be like, yet steadfast as the rocks and the trees and the animals that never change. Do you have a fifth rock? No. <laughs> <laughs> you missed it. No. <laughs> They're all pit rocks. I said it was going to sound funny. <laughs> uh, it's part of the reason that I, I'm comfortable in Tucson, too, I have to say that. And green things and, and all living things. Um, we have so many reminders around us that there's no way that we could ever say that we did not know that there was one God and that all things submitted to God. He is the one who raised the Gentiles, the messenger, to recite his <coughs> revelations for them before this they had gone astray. This is incredible mercy from, from God. He did not have to do this for us. We blew it the first time around. We just totally blew it. We missed. And, and this is a time when close is, is only good in horseshoes. This is a real big miss. God has no reason to do anything for us. He doesn't need us for anything. He doesn't need us to know him. He doesn't need that. And yet... He sends messengers, consistently sends messengers. 
spends 1,400 years purifying his final message. He didn't have to do that. I mean, he gave it once. Why spend 1,400 years sending even more messengers and purifying the message for the very few who hear it? A incredible mercy. I, God just did not have to do this for us. Um, we live in a world where not too many people are given second chances. You either pull your own weight or you're jettisoned like so much luggage or baggage. Uh, that's not God's pattern. Not only are we given one chance, but multiple chances throughout our lives to come to the truth. And so many messengers, and so many messengers, in so many ways. The mercy that is described in the, in the next verse as unlimited is beyond anything that we can understand. We have limits. We can give people multiple chances, but at some point, we're going to turn around and not give them another chance, and we're going to walk away. God doesn't leave that person. We do. God doesn't leave that person. Or us in those times. We cannot imagine what unlimited grace or mercy is. And I don't think we will until we die. Uh, and we know the extent of, of hell and heaven and love and mercy and peace that waits for us. Others among them refuse to join. This is verse 3. He is the Almighty, the wise. There's a verse, and this one I do know, Lisa, it's 8129, and I'll, you don't have to turn to it, I'll read it. It says, whatever you will is in accordance with the will of God, Lord of the universe. Um, for some time, the realization that whatever thoughts I had were not my own has been a mind boggler for me. The only thing I do is choose God alone. After that, this, this is an illusion, as I've spoken of before, including the, the illusion that I did something, that I thought something, that I had this idea. As Rashad said, God arranges everything, including the thoughts in our, in our minds. Those of us who are going to invent some new and exciting tool to make a job easier, when we do that and we discuss it with those fellow people, fellow colleagues, and say, look what, look what you thought of, look what I thought of, look what it will do, Never a thought that God did that. You didn't do that. God put the thought for the invention in your mind and brought it to reality. Every thought we have is in accordance with God, with God's will. Whether we are believers or not, God tailors each of our lives and experiences according to our original decision before we came. So that verse, which pops up as I read through so much of the Quran, is a constant reminder for me that whatever I will is according to the will of God, meaning I don't do it, I don't think it. This is God's grace. He bestows it upon whomever he wills. God possesses unlimited grace. The example of those who were given the Torah then failed to study it. I often wish when I'm talking to people that I could remember funny jokes that I've heard or these really great lines from the comedies on television are some really fun lines, and I don't have that kind of mind. This is one of those lines that I do remember, thank God. A donkey carrying great works of literature. There's another verse in Quran that refers to the ugliest voice being that of the donkey, um, which I remembered when I was reading this. I just don't know where it is. Um, the Quran is of no use to a disbeliever. It's totally sealed from them, from their understanding. They won't understand it. They can read it. They can read the concrete words, and they're very simple. They're attainable and understandable by, by everyone. And they don't see or hear what, what they just read. When you ask them, what does that mean, instead of ABC, you'll get some foreign language back that has no relationship to what people have read. God prevents Quran and the truth from getting to those people who are not believers. They are like donkeys carrying great works of literature. Or on the next page, uh, where <coughs> the metaphor of a wooden log is used, um, incapable of understanding. On the other hand, a donkey submits to God totally, absolutely, totally, and doesn't have need of a great work of literature. The donkey's already there. So it's, it's an interesting uh, group of words, a donkey carrying great works of literature.
And sometimes I feel like that when I'm trying to work on something new or hard or something that has been a part of me that needs to be purified. I feel like a donkey a lot of the time. I don't feel like I'm going anywhere and I'm sitting down in the middle of the road. Um, so this, this verse created a whole bunch of, of um, pictures for me when I read it. I, I thought it was wonderful. Miserable indeed is the example of those who reject God's revelations. God never guides the wicked people. Again, whatever we will is according to the will of God. If we choose not to be guided, we won't be guided. God gives us exactly, exactly what we want. Uh, we get impatient. We want it now. We want it next week. But God gives us what we need in what form we need when we need it, including the wicked people who reject God. They won't be able to say anything on the day of resurrection. Then they won't have to. Um, verse 6, O oh, you who are Jewish, if you claim that you are God's chosen to the exclusion of all others, then you should long for death. They never long for it because of what their hands are committed. <coughs> God is fully aware of the wicked. You don't have to be Jewish. There are lots of people who seem to feel that they're chosen for one thing or another. Um, we all know the, the history of the Jewish people, but there are so many others God is aware of each and every one of them who lives their lives according to their ego and their personal needs, which they focus on. And they really don't believe that God is going to do what God says, that there will be a day of resurrection and that they will be held accountable. So for those people who put themselves above other people and those people who put themselves ahead of other people, I pray to God I'm not behind them on the day of resurrection. Um, all of us are in the same boat. We're all responsible for our own necks, no matter whether we're Jewish, Christian, Muslim, or anything else. And I'm not sure that I can say right now that I long for death. I think I need a lot more work. Verse 8 says, the death that you flee from will inevitably catch up with you. And then you'll be turned over to the knower of all secrets and declarations. He will inform you of everything you did. Um, I read a book a while ago, a long while ago, when my children were little. It was about one of those pop psychology, psychiatry kinds of things, psychology kinds of things. It's about child psychology and about sibling rivalry and about children who fight with each other and drive parents crazy because they argue over everything and nothing. And the only thing I got out of this hundreds of pages of book was uh, a really cute scenario about these kids squabbling in a room and the din being so loud that no one could think. And this, the man suggested that the parent go to the door of the room, of course the kids would not notice that because they would be involved in their fight, and simply say, I saw that. And wait because both children or all children would then turn around and look up at the parent and begin to spill out at once, three voices at once. What happened? Well, he did this to me. No, he did that to me. And if you just waited for five minutes, you'd have the whole story. And you'd be able to put it in the right order and make a judgment that would be uh, correct. And when I read this verse, uh, then you will be turned over to the knower of all secrets and declarations. I see it like that. We don't know when our death is going to come. And when it comes, the Quran tells us many of us won't even know that we've died. We'll, we'll wake and, and, and be in with God, without God. And I see God standing there saying, I saw that, and I don't have to say anything, because he did that. Um, and that's not an uncomfortable feeling. That's a very comfortable feeling, to know that God is always with me, that God sees my mistakes and works on me to correct those mistakes, and that the things that I may have forgotten about, I'll be reminded about, hopefully in this world, and forgiven for in the next. Uh, does anybody have any comments or questions? Or up to the
see, they cut it a bit too far. God did choose them and give them the scripture, saved them from Egypt, split the sea for them. So in that sense, they were chosen, they were God's chosen. But uh, they made it exclusive. Also, it, uh, it, uh, they exaggerated it uh, way beyond uh, reason. First, they were God's chosen, then they became almost equal to God, you know, that should hands around his shoulder and walk around like friends. And then, then God became like a child, subhanAllah, God to glorify him. And Rabbi Kushner's book, where he, he, he talks as if God is a child, he says, it's okay, we forgive you. Literally, I'm not exaggerating. He said, uh, are you ready to forgive God for what he did to you because of his inability? You know, just, you hear him stand up and I tell you what he likes. And this is, uh, and this is, I mean, the extreme arrogance of the majority of them. So this is uh, uh, this is what happened to the distortion of the concept of being God's chosen. They, they distorted it and exaggerated it too much. The, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the synagogue, they send the kids here uh, maybe once a year to talk. And uh, one time the sign out there was happy to submission to God, and I was talking to the to those Jewish children here, and I was telling them that anyone who submits to God is a is a submitter, regardless of uh, the name Jewish, Christian, Muslim, or what. So one of the teachers <laughs> objected, "We do not submit to anybody." I said, "Not even to God, not even to God." So this is uh, almost typical of the majority. This is status that the majority of Jews, the majority of Christians, the majority of Muslims have been tricked by Satan. So this verse here, 6, is talking about the distortion of God's, God's uh, choosing. So the key word will be to the exclusion of all others. And also to make it like it's guaranteed. It doesn't matter what they do. That's why God says, going to long for death. And like Catherine said, we don't long for death because we know that the longer we worship God, the greater, the bigger, the more developed is our soul. And uh, also, we're not that arrogant. We don't, we don't, you have to be really arrogant to long for death. But if you feel that you need to develop and grow your soul, that you need to atone for past sins, and you want to make up for the past and things like that, you will not long for death. Actually, a lot of them do uh, think that automatically, you know, Muhammad will take the Arabs out of hell, which is a wrong concept. It's the, it's the exact opposite. <laughs> uh, when you talk about, about sibling rivalry, I guess these people didn't know about half of me and none. <laughs> These two go to the bathroom together. <laughs> 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 We've seen them. <laughs> I mean, they destroy all concepts of civic violence. Uh, actually, I have noticed it uh, with uh, with the Iranians a lot. People from I don't know what it is, but maybe a chemical. <laughs> not not girls in general. <laughs> No, 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 <laughs> Any other questions or questions? 
operates and functions around, you know, the worship of the Trinity, God, Jesus, and That's not Christianity. But as it exists That's today, actually Paulism. No, see, uh, by definition, a Christian is one who follows Christ. Uh, the so-called Christianity today is really a Paulism. It's not Christian. Uh, yeah, I've, I've read that. Book. You know, when you look at, I mean, is there a Jewish Christianity in existence today? Sure. Yeah. The Christians who do not be the the messes of God. The Christians, yes. That's a great Christian set. Yes. Yes, there's Jews. All kinds. Uh, Jews of all kinds. Orthodox Jews, Reform Jews, Conservative Jews who, uh, who are uh, true Muslims. See, that's kind of funny because it's all types. So, you consider every type One religion is practiced by Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, but it is one religion. So evolving. Well, uh, the, the message evolved with the, with, the, with the human race. No, there's no conflict at all. If you read, uh, read uh, the Bible, the Torah, read the Deuteronomy, it's beautiful, just like the Quran, read the Psalms. Like the Quran, Isaiah, Proverbs. Read the Bible, you'll find it identical. Read it, the written scripture started with the Torah. Okay. Then we have, after this, uh, uh, the Psalms of Isaiah and Solomon, uh, the Proverbs, which is Solomon's book. And they're all identical with the Quran. There's no conflict at all. Where is the conflict? Give me an example of the conflict. Gentiles are the people who do not have a scripture. God did not want to leave them alone. I mean, leave them uh, lost. He wanted to guide them. Oh. Yeah. Also, that uh, God knew that the other scriptures were touched by human beings that were changed or altered. And then we got the Quran, which was never, you know, the human being could never yeah. touch it. Never distorted. And, and it preserved. And, and, it, and it just gave the Arabs a different of guidelines that it gave Jews and Christians and, uh, and that's all that it is but the one that why it came after everything else is that God knew that this, this one was never going to be touched <laughs> okay actually it's the, this is the chicken and the egg uh, God God uh, permitted the distortion of the other scriptures because this is the one that is going to be in the whole world about 50 years from now 
the others will be history. But this is the only scripture, that is, this is the untouched, this is God's complete message to be given to the vast majority of the human race. I mean, even 50 years from now, we'll still have uh, 65 billion people coming to use this as their message. This is God's message going to supersede and take the place of all the others. Those older scriptures are supposed to uh, to vanish. This is why we have these overwhelming physical proofs that will simply take over the world, the whole world, just even the world 50 years from now, maybe less. This is God's. No, this is God's law. He said uh, we're going to come. Uh, Go look at page 396, right there in front of you, verse 9. He's the one who sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion, the religion of truth to make it prevail over all religions. This is God's law. It is not uh, wishful thinking. That indicates to this day also that I'm saying the time, 50 years. Yes. Islam would be the dominant, like America would, would be a Muslim country, if you want to look at it this way. It would no longer be a Christian, a Judeo-Christian country. It would be a Muslim country. And this is God's law. It is. I mean, today, can you call America a Muslim country? Okay, 50 years from now, America will be a Muslim country. And it's not wishful thinking. Huh? You are actually saying something that is based on your desire. <laughs> no, it is not. Apparently, you don't know the miracle, so I suggest that you read the miracle of Quran and look at it carefully, and then you will, you will agree with me. It says 50 years. Is that what you mean? Uh, maximum. Maximum 50 years. Probably be less than that. Be more like 20 years. Things are going to happen very fast in the next 20 years. So but I'm, giving, I'm giving myself a long time just to be careful. Mahmoud? It's, uh, it's the most Nineteen times, nineteen times, thirty-two. Uh, Hamid. No, I was just saying, twenty years or fifty years, whatever it is, it's an estimate that hopefully, inshallah, by this time, the world will be, will realize the real message. Yes, things are going to happen very fast, folks. So it is estimated. It is not like I said, fifty years is maximum, but most probably twenty years in your lifetime. Inshallah. Uh, Hamid, do you know do you know that the sun will rise tomorrow? Yeah. How? How do you know that? Because the uh, probability that you see uh, up to now is dead every day. Right. Because there are certain signs that uh, indicate. See, look at the clock. It is 8:15. In 12 hours, now it'll be 8:15 in the morning. So you know that the sun will come. This this is a sign that the the sunrise is approaching. And the same with, uh, if you read the American Quran and understand it, you will know that uh, this country will be Muslim within 20 to 50 years. And I showed you, it is God's law, I have to be in front of you. 61 verse 9. This is, uh, this is a verse that is repeated three times in the Quran. Back to Catherine, we're taking the whole thing from her. <laughs> verse 9. <laughs> 
O you who believe, when the Salat prayer is announced on Friday, you shall hasten to the commemoration of God and leave all business. This is better for you if you only knew. Once the Salat prayer is finished, you shall spread through the land, seeking God's bounties, and continue to commemorate God frequently, that you may succeed. Yet when they see business or entertainment, they rush to it and leave you standing. Say, what God possesses is far better than the entertainment and the business. God is the best provider. I think most of you know that I, I uh, am employed in a crisis center, and mashallah, I haven't missed a Friday, Juma, since going to work there. Actually, that coincided with a commitment on my part not to miss. And you can't organize crises. As you all know, they just kind of fall out of the sky, and every Friday, thank God, I've been able to walk out of there. And no one calls me back, and the building is still standing when I get back there, and no one says anything. Uh, um, it's very important that there is that we understand how important it is that we come in and join together on Fridays. There is nothing that should keep us from that. What I wrote in the margin, and I don't know when it was I wrote it, but I wrote in the margin of those three verses, illusion and unreal, and we need to leave it as easily as we turn off the television, because this is what's real. Coming together at Juma and to study Quran and be with believers is real. The rest of the world we live in is the illusion that God created to sustain us and guide us and teach us and extend his mercy to us. But it's set up entirely for us. It's like some giant playground. Some people get injured on the playground and some people have a wonderful time. But it is an illusion. And this is the real thing. There's nothing that should keep us from this. Absolutely nothing. Uh, does anyone have any comments on the last three verses? Well, how would you have uh, how would you have a group of people meet in your house? Friday in Arabic? And Jumma means what? Right, a group of people. Yeah. Friday came from Abraham, since the time of Abraham. What do you mean came first? Uh, I'll talk about two things. What are the two things? Is there a first and second in your mind? Yeah. I just want to understand your question. You said which came first? Yeah. Okay, what do you have in mind when you say which came first? The which and which? What and what? time when there was no names of the weekdays, like the Sabbath. So, but it you must Sabbath? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, they were having Friday prayers before Muhammad. We didn't know that all the, all the practices of Islam came through Abraham. Yeah. 
all, all the facts here, facts came from Abraham. Look at 16, 123, we'll tell you. That. No. No. Exactly the same, yeah. Absolutely, this is what I was going to say now. It is unfortunate that, uh, that my generation, for example, in Iran, they grew up with the lack of the Friday prayer. And it is not uh, as firmly implanted in them to do the Friday prayer until uh, the until Khomeini revolution came. Then they started to do the, the Friday prayer. And I found it disastrous with, from my observations. Uh, there were many fortunate people, like the Sabahis and the, the Mainis, they came to the Friday prayer readily. God is guiding them, and they, they did it easily. But it was not easy for many, many people to do the Friday prayer, and they found it disastrous for them. Just the Friday prayer, because they didn't do it, they, they, they caused their dropout. I mean, I know that. Uh, I'm just trying to emphasize the extreme importance of the Friday prayer. I mean, God is saying here, and drop all business. It is very important, and it says this is better for you. If you are waiting for somebody to sign a deal with you that will give you $10 million, and that is at the, at the time of the prayer, God is telling you, go to the Friday prayer and leave those $10 million, and, and it will be better for you. Because God will give you $20 million. It is very important, and it is difficult for uh, if we grow up like uh, the, the last generations in Iran. If we grow up without uh, the obligatory Friday prayer, it becomes more difficult to adapt to the Friday prayer. But at the same time, the reward is also doubled. It actually multiplied many fold for doing that. Uh, the world. Say, oh, you believe in men. Follow hadith. 
But uh, obviously here, the verse 9 says, all you who believe, it doesn't say men or women, this is an obligatory duty for men and women. It is very, very important. Why is it It's a commandment. This is a commandment from God. It says, Oh, you will believe when the Salat prayer is announced on Friday, you shall hasten to commemorate God and leave all business. This is a commandment from God. Well, I can say a few uh, reasons for uh, why that particular day is Friday. I think uh, it is the end of the week. And therefore, uh, you can't There's no excuse. What? Sorry. <laughs> so you can you can actually uh, go through the problems of the whole week and then uh, and add the problems and then uh, try to solve it within the community. That's, That's not the purpose. The purpose is not solving problems. The purpose is to commemorate that. But for the well being. In a group of people. So I think Just the purpose. I have a comment here. Yeah. This happens automatically. <coughs> if you carry out the commandment, this one will happen automatically. That's exactly the purpose of the final prayer. We will get together and we, <coughs> we know each other. Not only to get to the praise of God, because they only can praise God at our home, you know, one person at a time. Better in a place, there's uh, 100,000 people in the universe. So you, you agree with the final prayer that this is important, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's good. But we, we agree. There must be change the situation if you stay at home. What if, uh, what if the Imam is giving fantastic lessons that will save your life? Why do you uh, assume the negative? The Imam cannot give us a fantastic lesson. We discuss it. We have shown rather. We have lots of people from different sides, from different groups, you know, discuss it all. You see what happened, what has happened to you from Shambhati to Imam. Saturday, Sunday, but Thank you. 
I don't think anyone's objecting to the to do the Friday prayer on Friday. No, but I mean, the idea is that, that Friday, because that, that allows you to discuss everything Friday. Well, people are free to say what they want. But Friday, you're emotional already. We don't have any classes. You don't have any work to do. You are all off. You know, is it business like this Saturday over here? Why on Saturday they were late for the party? Oh, Martha, Martha, please, let's not discuss nonsense here. I mean, not you, so please, just, we can go on discussing the event talk. Let's go back to Catherine and Surah 62, 63. We can make an assumption and go on discussing it, you know. What if the sky is green? You know, let's discuss that. <laughs> 63. <coughs> the hypocrites. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. The hypocrites come to you and say, We bear witness that you are the messenger of God. God knows that you are his messenger, and God bears witness that the hypocrites are liars. They use their oaths to deceive and to repel others from the path of God. Evil indeed is what they do. They have believed and disbelieved. Consequently, their hearts were sealed, and consequently, they cannot understand. When you see them, you may be impressed by their appearance, and when they speak, you hear their voice. But they are like wooden logs. They think that every cry is intended against them. Beware of them. God curses them, for they have deviated. When they are told, Come, let the messenger of God ask forgiveness for you, they turn their heads away, repulsed by their arrogance. Whether you ask forgiveness for them or do not ask forgive them, forgiveness for them, God will not forgive them. God does not guide the wicked people. They are the ones who say, don't give any charity to those who follow the messenger of God, that they may abandon him. To God belongs the treasures of the heavens and the earth, but the hypocrites don't understand. They say, if we return to the city, the powerful will displace the weak therefrom. All dignity and power belong to God and to his messenger and the believers, but the hypocrites don't know. Verse 1, uh, the footnote says, even though the hypocrites are uttering a truth, God calls them liars. Teaches us that we must reject all fabrications attributed to the prophet under the name of Hadith, even if such Hadith narrates a truth. The fabrication of a good Hadith is the bait that Satan uses to cover a deadly hook. There are many people who are very talented with words in their individual languages. And how scriptures and hadith and the oral traditions in the Jewish faith and so on came to be was those human beings who were very talented with words took the truths and elaborated upon them to the point where they became man-made laws, regulations, suggestions, traditions, to the point where those became the truths that people followed as opposed to the real message which was at the core originally. There is some truth, some veracity to what we hear in all things. The test is to figure out where it is and what it is. If you know what the truth is from the beginning, you can recognize the distortions. Sometimes they're so well done that it's hard to argue with people because you're not as well, uh, you're not as articulate as they are, for instance. Some people are very articulate and very well versed with the words and very good abstract thinkers, if I can use that phrase. And I'm not. I just know what the truth is, thank God. And when it starts to get so complicated that it's hard to find it in, in what I'm hearing, I have to stop that, and I have to say, no, there is a bottom line here. God says, even if there's truth in what we hear, mixed in with the distortion, we're to discard all of it, because it is a game, and it's Satan's game. It isn't a person's game that's talking to you. It's Satan's game. Satan's out to bring us on those things that we're perhaps not as sure about, not as, as able to argue about, to get us to go to him and forget God alone. And this is really difficult because this is in the media, this is in the newspapers, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in comedy. It, it's on street signs. I mean, the distortions are everywhere, and the truth is always buried in there somewhere. Uh, it's almost like playing chess. You know, when it's your turn to move, you have to walk very carefully to the next square because there's so much of that stuff all around us. And it's, it's stuff. Don't laugh. You're looking at something else. 
Chess. Chess. And spaghetti, no doubt. Uh, okay. They use their oaths to deceive and to repel others from the path of God. Evil, indeed, is what they do. They've believed and disbelieved. Consequently, their hearts were sealed and they cannot understand. Once a person has believed and then disbelieved, they're done. Uh, God will continue to support that person throughout their life here and give them even the things that they want, but they'll never get to the truth. Once they have had it and gave it up, they won't be able to come back. And God is, is very definite in this verse about that. And then goes on to describe them as if they were wooden logs. And we may be impressed, as I said earlier, by their appearance, by the... Verse 8 says that all dignity and power belong to God, to his messenger, and the believers. But the hypocrites don't know. We are provided for. Everything we need is provided for. So when people who don't understand that plot and scheme to prevent us from getting the things that we're supposed to get. It's totally useless. We get what we're supposed to get from God, not from anyone else. So those schemes and, and uh, plans to disrupt or disband or, or fight with don't go anywhere. They're diffused before they ever get off the ground. What they do do is keep those people occupied and out of our business while we go about it. <laughs> because they're busy doing things that are, are fruitless. And that's a form of protection for us as well, because we know that we can't be hurt uh, by them. Does anyone have any comments, additions, subtractions on that section? means is that God will accept the prayer for forgiveness for the believers, but not for the hypocrites. This is what it's telling us. They, they, they are too arrogant anyway, and they don't have the belief in their hearts, so they think it's all nonsense anyway. But no, it uh, actually proves there is no shifa. Because uh, it's only the believers who will, uh, who will be helped, and the believers are going to heaven anyway. Uh, the disbelievers and the hypocrites cannot be helped, so what's the use of shafa? So this is what the, the Quranic position is. The Quranic position is that uh, every one of us, inshallah, when we go to heaven, will say, please God, I want my mother with me. I love her very much. Okay? And this is shafa. You will say it, I will say it, everybody will say it, inshallah in heaven. And uh, now this shafa'ah is useful if the mother is a good person that is already going to heaven. If the mother was not to go to heaven, this shafa'ah would not do any good, therefore it is really useless. But we would say it anyway, out of emotion. So this is the understanding of shafa'ah. And this is exactly what this verse was saying. He's saying when the messenger asks prayers for forgiveness, or it will be accepted for the believers, but not for the hypocrites or the disbelievers. Exactly. Because it's true. It's our human nature to, to it do it. Because it's Because it's something that is, uh, because it's a fact. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Everyone, anybody can repent. I think this is a point that Catherine raised, but uh, if a person goes back from uh, belief to disbelief, they can always repent and come back to it. There are other verses in the Quran, in uh, Surah 4, verse 137, it says, if you, you can believe, disbelieve, believe, disbelieve, and so on. So uh, the Quran is talking about the period when they are disbelievers. No, 
there is no such thing as God cannot. Just repeat. <laughs> Rephrase your question. No, 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 there's no such thing as God cannot. Okay, now rephrase the question. There you go. Yeah, now, now we can have. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, this is the end of the verse. Look at it, uh, verse uh, 6. God does not guide the wicked people. They're already wicked, so he does not guide them. Yes, they can, because this is our free decision. God will the God will the repentance. The minute they change the decision to believers, they are believers. Not as long as they're hypocrites or disbelievers. Only when they make a decision to believe. Right. As soon as they make a decision to believe, they step into God's kingdom. Right. As long as they're hypocrites and disbelievers, they're outside of God's uh, circle. Like this. These verses, God is revealing to us the inequalities of hypocrites. He's revealing to us what otherwise we wouldn't know. We couldn't see the alive. God is revealing to us what otherwise we may not be able to see. We still don't see. Exactly. Yeah. Like we don't see. God it. sees more by this. God says, I know them, you don't know them. Right. And the, other, the other point I wanted to make is basically, when he uses the example of wood logs, does this mean, for example, like wood floating in water, it's all surface? No. I'm not just true. asking for those hollow logs or something that appears to be a surface. Can, can you communicate with a wooden log? Oh, thank <laughs> <laughs> In fact, there's an Arabic, there's an Egyptian, excuse me, there's an Egyptian proverb and an English proverb. So they're standing there like a log. Is this an English? Turkey, yes. And an Arabic, too. In English, I mean, in uh, Egyptian. Uh, did we finish Surah 63? Okay, go ahead, finish. Verse 9. O you who believe, do not be distracted by your business and your children from the commemoration of God. Those who do this are losers. And spend in charity from what we provide for you before death comes to the one of you, and then say, My Lord, if you postpone this for a short while, I'll be charitable and righteous. God never postpones the end for any soul once the predetermined time has come. God is cognizant of everything you do. The easiest thing in the world to do is to be distracted by those that we care about the most. And God warns us against that. In other verses, it says that these may be enemies of ours, and we do need to be cautious of that and avoid idolatry. Spending in charity is so easy if we know that nothing we have came from us or will go with us anywhere. It comes from God. It's not ours to start with. And if we give it in charity, we give it only where it was meant to go. Uh, verse 11 says, God never postpones the end for any soul, and once the time comes, it's come, and there's nothing more that you can do after the day of resurrection. But there is so much mercy from God, and we have so many chances before that day. So many. They're limitless. As long as we live, we have a, we have a chance, an opportunity. God constantly provides those opportunities for the hypocrites to repent, for us to continue to work right up until the last moment that Verse 11 sounds very final, but when we know the mercy of God and what he provides for us on a minute-to-minute, second-to-second basis in this world, it's, it's extraordinary, and, and it doesn't need to frighten us. It just We just need to know that, that there is a limit, and once we've reached it, it's over. We have no more to do. Any other comments and questions? Yeah, go ahead. Well, let's get to the. Well, let's thank Catherine for an excellent Quranic study. I can go to 1:14 in 10 minutes. You said you wanted me to go. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll get to general questions. For
But everything God said, sister. The number of times that the subject that the boss being mentioned is not that uh, That's a good sign, yeah. But all, all of them are important. All the laws are important. So I want to go back to the Friday business. Remember that the, that the title of the surah is named after prayer. Friday. There's a surah in the Quran and the title Friday. And the commandment is there saying, all you who believe in the Salat prayers announced on Friday, go and drop on this. This is the commandment. All the commandments of God are important. Uh, but this is the basic requirement. You know, I mean, it's, it's not there, so nothing else exists. Everything else will be in vain. I mean, a person can be truthful and honest and uh, is a very nice person, but he does not believe in God. All his work is in vain. So, La ilaha illallah goes without saying. <laughs> then after that, all the commandments are very important. Every single one of them. For example, time to say, Salat is more important than Zakat? No. Try to mention more than Actually, they are both uh, usually mentioned together. Salat and Zakat. Or fasting. Fasting is very important. You disobey God if you don't fast. You disobey God if you don't do the zakat. You disobey God if you don't do the prayer. You disobey God if you lie or cheat. So, <laughs> take your pick. It's very expensive if you. But God, but also, like, I think it's important to say that God's not so strict. You have to do it. God always gives. You know, people who can't do it, it gives alternatives. Well, it's our choice. You know, you can put your finger in the fire or not. You can. It's up to you. I mean, it's God, God left us, left it, left it uh, up to us. You heard Jahan today. If he doesn't want to do the push-ups, <laughs> he will, he will uh, think that God is doing everything, not him. So it's, it's as simple as that. We're celebrating Lila's birthday today. <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass you. <laughs> Uh, our birthday was the 19th of March. That's all. And she didn't even know that her address was the month of 19. <laughs> so uh, this is why she came to Tucson. <laughs> she her birthday with us. There are so many uh, things that uh, I need, uh, we need to do. We read Al-Fatiha for Su'al, remember? Because of her tests. Well, she passed. Oh. <laughs> God never turns us down. <laughs> and uh, Ahmed needs uh, that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help him with his PhD exam this Monday. Okay, do it for me too. Yes, of course. Yes, you better, you better ask him. God is generous. God is generous. And uh, we have a perfect record so far, alhamdulillah. God never, never turned us down. Strange things we ask for, <laughs> and He never turned us down. We even overturned governments. <laughs> we did that. Uh, what else? You're supposed to remind me. Who else asked for the fact? Huh? Yes, we said the Fatiha for Linda Baroni because she's, she had uh, some infection in the hospital. It's all right. We want to take advantage of uh, Jahan's uh, presence, so he'll be the, our teacher next week. So he wants to go AWOL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Serious? What are you leaving? Which one? This one? Three years old. 
this Monday? That's not the fact that he stays. Okay? <laughs> 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 yeah, <thank you. laughs> okay, so let us uh, recite the Fatiha and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give uh, Layla a happy year coming up. Every year to be happier than the previous year. And we're going to recite also Al Fatiha for Su'ad, for her coming test, and for Ahmad Rayyan. The fact had to keep John here in Tulsa for a while, at least a few weeks, at least. And as you recite the Fatiha, tell to God and ask him for your own personal wishes, anything you want. The Fatiha, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Malik Yawm al-Din, Iyaka na'bud wa Iyaka nasa'in, Ihdina al-Sirat al-Mustaqim. Surat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim Rayn al-Mawdubi alayhim wa al-Dharim Congratulations, you special people. Yes, of course. Was I supposed to? No, we didn't. Yes. Wakasandihaqa La yasma'oona fiha lawran wa la kizzaba Jazaa رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما الرحمن لا يملكون منه خطابا يوم يقوم الروح والملائكة صفا لا يتكلمون لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن وقال صوابا ذلك اليوم الحق فمن شاء اتخذ إلى ربه مآبا إنا أنذرناكم عذابا قريبا يوم ينظر المرء ما قدمت يداه يوم ينظر المرء ما قدمت يداه ويقول الكافر يا ليتني كنت ترابا